Welcome everyone to this week's Mountain West AETC Echo. Really excited to see you all. Thanks for joining us. And I am very happy to introduce Dr. Ariel Davis, a neurologist here who has recently published about symptoms of neurosyphilis. When I saw this, I got excited. I thought it'd be a great topic. As we discussed last week, there is just a lot of syphilis in the world right now and in our communities. There's a lot of neurosyphilis going around. So I think this is very, very timely. And Ariel, I appreciate you doing this. Yeah, no, thanks for the invitation. Hello to everybody. So as you can see on the slide, I'm going to be talking about how well do neurologic symptoms identify individuals with neurosyphilis, and this is work I did with others here listed on the slide, including Dr. Christina Mara. So I have no disclosures, and in terms of, this is probably something you guys are all very familiar with, so I think the challenge with neurosyphilis is it can present in a number of different forms. And the other thing that is really important about neurosyphilis is that it can happen at any stage during infection with syphilis. As you can see on this slide here showing the natural history, once someone is infected with syphilis, you actually can get early CNS invasion in up to at least 40% of people. The majority of people will clear it, but not everyone does. And if it's not cleared, it can lead to persistent meningitis or asymptomatic neurosyphilis, and then if it goes on to cause symptoms, the early symptoms that we can see include symptomatic meningitis, which can be associated with vision loss or hearing loss, but also, as you know, vision loss and hearing loss can occur in isolation without meningitis. Early syphilis can also cause meningovascular disease, which can present with stroke or focal neurologic deficits. And then the less common forms of neurosyphilis are the late forms. These are really the forms that take years or decades of untreated disease to develop. And so this is the general paresis, which is the dementia personality changes that can occur, or the spinal cord disorder, tabes dorsalis, that can cause really profound sensory impairment and gait and coordination. And so the other thing that I'm sure you're all well aware of is that the CDC guidelines for when do you do a lumbar puncture in patients with syphilis looking for neurosyphilis are a little bit difficult to use because I think they basically just list all neurologic signs and symptoms that are possible. Um, and so cranial nerve dysfunction, meningitis, stroke, altered mental status, loss of vibration sense, vision loss, hearing loss, any one of these would potentially prompt you to do a lumbar puncture in a patient. And then I think the other thing that's hard to apply in clinical practice is that a number of these meningitis, stroke, and even altered mental status are also represent sort of a constellation of other symptoms. So meningitis, for example, headaches, photosensitivity, neck stiffness. So if you have a patient who comes in with a headache and has syphilis, is that enough? Are you going to do a lumbar puncture on them? Um, and I think that can be hard to know what to do with. And so what we really sought to ask were, are certain neurologic symptoms more predictive of neurosyphilis than others? And so we had the advantage of a prospective study with a large group of participants where we were looking at cerebral spinal fluid abnormalities in syphilis. And really the entry criteria for being in the study were that you had untreated syphilis and there was some concern by the referring provider that there might be neurosyphilis. And this was based either on neurologic symptoms, an RPR that was greater than or equal to 132, or in HIV-infected participants, a CD4 T cell count that was less than or equal to 350 cells per microliter. And then as part of the study, all participants underwent a standardized assessment of symptoms with an in-person interview administered by a clinician and all of the symptoms were rated as none, mild, moderate, or severe. All participants underwent blood work and a lumbar puncture. And for the purposes of our study, neurosyphilis was rigorously defined as a reactive CSF, cerebral spinal fluid venereal disease research laboratory test, uh, CSF-VDRL, which is often considered the gold standard for diagnosis of neurosyphilis. And I'm sure, as you guys all know, is this test that is very specific but not particularly sensitive for the diagnosis. In terms of, again, because we were look, thinking about clinical symptoms, it's important to know what we assessed. And so these were the things that were, again, assessed with an in-person clinician-administered interview. We looked at headaches, stiff neck, photophobia, 
gait incoordination, vision loss, ocular inflammation, hearing loss, and sensory loss. Tinnitus is in parentheses because it was only started to be collected midway through the study, so only 18% of people had that documented, so it was not included in the analysis. And then we looked at symptoms grouped by mild or greater severity or moderate or greater severity. And these are the participants who were part of the study. And so of 466 participants, you can see the majority were HIV infected. So 385 had HIV, 81 were HIV uninfected. And sort of representing the demographic of syphilis in Seattle, the majority were middle-aged men. In the HIV-infected participants, they were more likely to have early syphilis, so 69% had primary, secondary, or early latent, whereas that was 42% in the HIV-uninfected. And then you can see in both groups, the RPR titer was on average 1 to 64, but the interquartile range was higher for the HIV-infected group. And then the majority of participants did have at least one neurologic symptom, so 81% in the HIV uninfected, 79% in the HIV infected group. And then again, as defined by having a CSF VDRL that was reactive, 25% of the HIV uninfected and 18% of the HIV infected had neurosyphilis. And then in terms of the neurologic symptoms that the participants actually reported, you can see those here. And again, remember that the majority of participants did have symptoms. When you look at the HIV uninfected, the most common symptoms that you can see reported were really vision loss, headache, and hearing loss. Whereas the, in the HIV infected participants, the most common symptoms were again vision loss, headache, and ocular inflammation were the top three in each group. And that you can see that the only significant differences between the two groups, so the HIV uninfected participants were more likely to have hearing loss, sensory loss, or gait incoordination. And then when we look at what symptoms were actually associated with neurosyphilis as defined by a reactive CSF VDRL, you can see that number one in the HIV uninfected group, none of the neurologic symptoms was associated with neurosyphilis. But in the HIV infected group, mild, if you had a, an odds ratio of around two or a little higher of having neurosyphilis if you had mild or greater photophobia, gait incoordination, or vision loss. The strongest association was for moderate or greater vision loss with an odds ratio of 6.7, and then moderate or greater hearing loss followed with a 3.1 times odds of having neurosyphilis. And then again, if we look again at these symptoms um, and we look at the sensitivity and specificity of these neurologic symptoms for the diagnosis of neurosyphilis in the HIV infected, you can see that while with the exception of mild vision loss, these symptoms have reasonable specificity, ranging from 85 to 95%. The sensitivity is very low, so really 13% to 65%. And so what this means in terms of clinical practice, because again, we are trying to make this more pragmatic and useful for clinical purposes, is that because the sensitivity is low, it's not going to be a good screening test. If your patient doesn't have these symptoms, you can't rule out neurosyphilis. But if your patient does have one of these symptoms, it's going to make you more suspicious that they could have neurosyphilis. So it's more ruling it in rather than ruling it out. And so in conclusion, we did find that there are specific neurologic symptoms, at least in the HIV-infected participants with syphilis, that can predict neurosyphilis. And these are mild or greater photophobia, mild or greater gait incoordination, mild or greater vision loss, and moderate or greater hearing loss. But neurologic symptoms do not predict a reactive CSF VDRL in the HIV uninfected group. And this was not something that we anticipated. Um, and so the reasons for this are up for debate. Um, you know, part of it could be we just had a smaller number in the HIV uninfected group. But the other theory here is that potentially cerebral spinal fluid abnormalities might just be more common in symptomatic neurosyphilis in the HIV infected rather than the HIV uninfected. 
And this reference below is a review paper that looks at HIV infected and HIV uninfected patients with syphilitic uveitis. And they found that those who had HIV infection and syphilitic uveitis were 1.3 times more likely to have cerebral spinal fluid abnormalities than the HIV uninfected. So there's at least some hint in the literature that this might be the case. And then the other big thing that's important is, again, lack of symptoms does not ensure a negative CSF VDRL regardless of the HIV status. And really the reason for this is that asymptomatic neurosyphilis is something that is common. And so, again, just because your patient doesn't have symptoms, that unfortunately does not mean they don't have neurosyphilis. And so in terms of our study, I think the strengths of the study were that we did have a large sample size. We had systematic assessments of the clinical symptoms, and they were all, the clinical symptoms were all assessed in person with a clinician. Again, it was designed to be pragmatic. We are trying to answer a practical clinical question. In terms of limitations, sorry, this, this should be over in limitations. We had a low number of HIV uninfected participants. We did do multiple comparisons, which sometimes can make it more likely that we are finding things that aren't truly significant. And then I think the definition of neurosyphilis is obviously something that debated, and clinically we don't often use just the reactive CSF VDRL because while it's very specific, it's not very sensitive. And so I think in clinical settings, we more often rely on the CSF pleocytosis, which we did not assess, although we did look at that and it actually didn't change the results significantly. And then we did not formally assess cognitive complaints in this study, although there was a cognitive screen. And then just some acknowledgments. And again, Christina Mara is really the, the force behind this, and it's funded by the NIH and INDS. <clears throat> and I'm happy we'll to, save that one. <laughs> to answer any questions. Ariel, <laughs> have questions. thanks so much.